Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our fourth session in our six part yoga series, Cultivate Balance in Self Mastery. Um, before we begin, I just want to um, let you guys know that we do have our check in sheet. So you can use that before the class um, in post class to check in with your mood um, and your feelings and kind of be able to measure and see how that changes by using some of the skills that you're learning through this um, presentation. And so in the series, we will explore bipolar disorder from a unique perspective. Brooke and Violet will connect yoga philosophy and gentle accessible yoga practices with psychoeducation. Breath awareness, gentle movement, and simple meditation will be repeated and also completely optional. And if you did not join us for our previous sessions, um, you can take a moment after this class to watch the recordings on our YouTube or Facebook or website um, where you can hear about Violet's and Brooke's mental health journey um, with yoga and also learn some of the skills that we've been building on. So thank you both for joining us again and offering our community this wonderful practice. Mm. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. So um, I just wanted to say again, thank you for having us. And Emily, particularly, you've been really like a dream to work with. So oh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, too. So we're going to start with a little bit of a check in, um, a grounding. We've been doing this in the other um, sessions, too. So if you feel to, you might just bring your awareness to your seat. Um, adjusting if you need to, to make yourself more comfortable. And bringing your awareness to your spine if you feel to. Bringing your awareness to the natural curves of the spine. And that would include the curve of the low back and the curve at the back of the neck. We tend to hunch a little bit, especially with all this work on the computer lately. So you might inhale and lift your heart as if at a diagonal from the floor. Exhale, relax the shoulders and glide the chin back slightly, keeping the floor of the chin parallel to the earth. And I like to say double chins are beautiful in yoga. So if you feel to exaggerate that a little bit more, gliding the chin back so that you can perhaps attune to a central channel of energy, the spine, the spinal cord, or what we call the astral spine in yogic anatomy. From the root, or the tailbone up to the sacrum, the fused part of the spine at the back of the pelvis, that curve at the low spine, moving forward toward the navel, and then upward still, curving back slightly behind the heart, noticing the breath here if you feel to at the heart for a moment. And then moving upward still from the heart toward the throat and the neck as the spine starts to curve again toward the front side of the body. And then upward still toward the medulla oblongata, the brain. And then if you feel to bringing your awareness to any subtle energy that might move from the stem of the brain or the base of the brain toward the prefrontal cortex or the spiritual eye, the third eye, the highest center of consciousness.
Keeping the spine tall. Might need to re-engage and lift and lift again. Rock forward on the sits bones a little bit so that you can re-engage that curve in the low back, which will help the vertebral bones to stay stacked on top of one another with the least amount of effort. Again, lifting your awareness, if you feel to, toward the spiritual eye in a relaxed way, keeping the gaze soft, eyes closed or open. Relaxing the jaw, allow the jaw to hang. The teeth and the lips may part slightly. And staying connected by way of the tip of the tongue, resting gently on the roof of the mouth behind the backs of the front teeth. Noticing the activity of the mind. Noticing if you are breathing through the mouth or the nose. It can be more soothing to the nervous system to breathe through the nose. So if you find that you are mouth breathing, you might allow yourself to begin to transition toward breathing through the nose. It can be, um, there can be some resistance. So you might practice by inhaling through the nose and then exhaling through the mouth if you find yourself breathing through the mouth. And then switching, if you feel to, breathing in through the mouth, out through the nose. To eventually allow yourself to breathe in and out through the nose. We're working our way slowly toward those fullest expressions of the techniques. No need to master. This is a practice. Progress, not perfection. I'm taking this a little bit further, if you feel to, I'd like to introduce what's called the double breath. The double breath is a sniff, sniff, ha, ha breath. It's a short and a long inhalation through the nose. And a short and a long exhalation through the mouth and the nose. And then breathing in again, if you feel to with the double breath or a natural breath. Having yourself pause at the top if you feel to, and then exhaling. <sighs> Not rushing into the next breath. Key here is to allow that second phase of the exhalation, the long ha, to be really long. Point between the eyebrows. <sighs> Top 
tall spine. Noticing that valley or a pause, that swing of the hammock at the end of the exhalation, a little bit of instant Maui. And then inhaling again, if you feel to with the double breath. And if you'd like, as you inhale, you can tense the body. Tensing the whole body, inhaling, holding. And then as you exhale, relax the body. Noticing that shift of subtle energy and breathing in again, if you feel too tensing. Feet, legs, belly, hands, arms, chest, neck. Exhaling, point between the eyebrows. And then once more, if you feel to inhale, tense. Exhale, relax. And now if you feel to, we'll practice what Violet suggested in our last session, that sort of even count breath, if you feel to inhale to a count of four. Hold for four. Exhale for four. Breathing in when you're ready for four. Hold for four, unless it causes anxiety. Exhale for four. Inhale when you're ready. Hold. Exhale for four. Inhale when you're ready. It might be four, it might be less. Hold. Exhale for four. And a couple more times if you feel to. And then releasing the technique if you feel to. And let's just take a quiet minute or so to observe the natural breath, the activity of the mind, tall spine, lifting your attention toward the prefrontal cortex, relaxing the jaw.
And coming back as you feel ready to, allowing yourself to begin to gently open the eyes when you're ready, allowing the light in as opposed to drawing your consciousness or attention outward. Stay withdrawn in your own experience. And usually at this point, we start to talk a little bit about some concepts. I'm wondering if it would be okay with Emily and Violet if we do just a little bit more movement for the spine. Are you okay with that? Yeah, of course. I think that would be lovely. Okay. So Violet was also showing us in the last few sessions a few movements that are pretty typical for um, a yoga class or yoga session. One of them is called cat-cow stretching. You can practice cat-cow on your hands and knees in tabletop position or sitting in a chair, sitting upright. And I'll talk you through doing this sitting upright. I'd like to suggest starting on an exhalation. And as you exhale, begin to round the spine. You can press the back of the, um, the low back back tuck the chin and then as you're ready to inhale lengthen the front side of the spine lift the heart avoid jackknifing the back of the neck fill the lungs let the breath do the work of stretching the rib cage at the front body and then exhale as you're ready to and begin to round again i'm moving in sort of an exaggerated way to be sure that you understand the concept but less may be more, inhaling when you're ready to, lengthening, lifting tall, lifting the heart, finding a little bit of a back bend. You can make it more subtle as you exhale, find a little bit of rounding. So you're getting a forward bend here. Especially if your mind is busy, you might do this a little bit more subtly. Inhaling and lifting the heart, finding your back bend. If you practice it more subtly, it might capture your attention a bit more. We'll do this a few more times in whatever way feels right to you. Exhaling, forward bend. Take your time. Inhaling into a backward bend. You can move the arms, whatever feels right to you. Expanding on the inhale. Especially if you have depression, you might stay here for a breath or two if you'd like. Exhaling, contracting. If you have anxiety, you might stay here for a few breaths. Next moods, you might just keep moving in a gentle flow. Coming back to center as you're ready. Again, avoid rushing into the next exercise. You might take a moment to pause and feel sitting with that upright spine, recapturing a sense of that channel of electricity magnetism, space, point between the eyebrows, relaxed throat and jaw. So practicing interoception or internal perception. And then moving the spine side to side, if you feel to, I'm going to bring my hand palm, you can't really see this, but to face forward to protect the shoulder. Inhale, lifting the arm out to the side, up and over, finding a stretch on the outside of the rib cage. Staying here for as long as feels right for you, exhaling, coming back down. 
Let this be slow. Let this be comfortable and nourishing, inhaling the opposite side up and over. Keep the sits bones pressed down, exhaling, coming down. And we'll do this just a couple more times, both sides. Not rushing. Notice what the neck is doing. Avoid collapsing in the neck. Keep the spine long so that that energy can move through without any hurdles or hitches in the giddy up. And then if you feel to take another moment, recapturing a sense of your internal perception and stillness. Notice the breath and the exhalation in particular, let the exhale be complete or a little bit longer than your inhale, if that's comfortable for you. And one final movement, if you feel to a gentle twist. So if you have osteoporosis or any spinal issues and you wanna back off, Practice this in your mind, visualizing it, lifting the heart, inhaling, so that we avoid a crunching and turning. We wanna stay lifted. And if you feel to inhale, lifting the arms up and over the head, and then rotate to the side from the lower spine, not exaggerating this, be subtle. And then exhale and bring your arms down here in your twist. Like you're one of those wine bottle openers I think of in this move. Inhale, still twisted, draw the arms up over the head. Rotate through center to the other side, slowly, gently, and exhale and bring the arms down. Inhale when you're ready, palms face forward, protecting the shoulder, Rotating through center to the other side and then exhaling the arms down. Heart stays lifted, shoulders relaxed, find the length in the spine. Point between the eyebrows, chin glides back, inhaling up. Through the nose ideally, rotating through center toward the other side, exhaling down. Draw the belly in at the end of the exhale, engaging the muscles of the pelvic floor. Inhale, draw the arms up. Draw the breath up to the spiritual eye. Rotate through the middle to the other side. Exhale down when you're ready. Tall spine. Draw the navel back. And once more, inhale up. Rotate through center, exhale as you're ready, down. Spine tall, shoulders relaxed, navel draws back. And then once more to come back to center, inhale the arms up. Lifting your energy up. Hands palms together at center. As you exhale, you're welcome to draw the hands down toward the midline of the body if that's comfortable whatever feels right to you. And we'll just take one more moment to relax and feel. Breathing in and out through the nose if possible.
Observing the felt sense of your deepest relaxation or furthest withdrawal of the senses from the world internally. And we'll use that as the new baseline from which we move as we begin to transition toward a more conversational phase of our session today. Staying quiet if you feel to. Opening the eyes as you feel ready to. Gently allowing the light in. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So, You're welcome. Thank you. So as Brooke mentioned, we're going to now kind of transition into more of a conversation, um, which includes a question and answer after we first um, kind of discuss anxiety. And so if you have any questions during this, um, please make sure to either put them in the Q&A or the chat, or if you're watching on our Facebook Live in the comment section, um, so we can just kind of have a discussion and you know talk about anything that you'd like us to talk about. So yeah, just jump right into it. So um, we talked about, Violet and I talked about mixed moods in the last couple of sessions, and we wanted to talk about anxiety a little bit today. Um, I think of anxiety as expansive and restless and um, maybe um, characterized um, in Ayurveda by the elements of air and space. Air moves very easily. Um, space includes all of the other elements, um, earth, uh, water, fire, and air. And so there can be a lot going on in an anxious mind and, um, and also uh, sort of zipping around a little bit. Um, so the remedy of opposites in Ayurveda would be to bring in some grounding, um, some contracting, um, bringing in something to weigh down that movable and cold, actually, energy um, so that we can warm up a little bit and slow down a little bit and be more in present moment. Um, we talk about um, anxiety being very expansive. And so allowing ourselves to withdraw might even include um, quieting any simulation in the space where you are. I like to wear an eye mask um, when I'm uh, sleeping. And when I wake up, I put the eye mask over my brow, my pineal gland, which is um, going to be affected by light. Um, avoiding flashing lights that can be um, sort of uh, rattling to me um, and also keeping um, sounds down to a minimum um, especially if I'm feeling overstimulated just want to um, create an environment that feels calming um, and again for from a yogic perspective and the asana perspective or the postural um, forms that we take for the physical body um, practicing downward facing poses um, and forward bends would be the remedies, um, so to speak, for um, an anxious mind to relieve that anxiety. Violet, did you have anything that you wanted to say about that? I have another idea or two, but you had talked about the message of anxiety, if there's a message that that state. A couple weeks ago, I think you and I, in a private conversation, maybe we're talking about that. Um, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I'll mute myself. Yes, and I know I'm I'm trying to almost not contribute less because I'm so present here, but my internet is very unstable. So if I'm not talking as much, I, I'm just trying to, uh, you know, not have those glitches. But yeah, so I'm not sure exactly. We talk so much about anxiety because it's, a very common thing that so many people experience. So 
I know that for me personally, it's that feeling of overwhelm and that consistent kind of loop of a, of a thought pattern of, and you know, that anxiousness about some uncertainty um, or something that feels like it's out of your control or it's very difficult to manage. And that can be really, really overwhelming. So I think that everything that, that Brooke has said is those yoga poses are such a great antidote for that sort of hyperactivity and, and overwhelm. And sometimes it can be very difficult to, to sort of bring yourself down. So along the way, it is uh, difficult, I think, to sit with sometimes your emotions and how you're feeling. And I personally believe that it's crucial in order to to come down and in order to be able to start managing is being able to sit with what it is that I'm feeling. And that's been a a sort of tool for me is knowing, okay, I'm like, I'm so uncomfortable right now, but if I let myself sit with it, then I can relax. I think about the, the first Harry Potter movie where they are trying to get to this chamber and they fall into a trap with this plant that like squeezes you really, really tight. And the more you resist it, the tighter it squeezes. And then once you relax, it releases you. And I think about that with anxiety in a, in a very, very similar way is the moment that I find myself just relaxing. Yoga is an amazing avenue for me as the physical movement and the breath everything that we have discussed with breath awareness and extending the exhale. Like I notice when I'm anxious, even with my internet, I'm like, oh, my, my exhale is, <laughs> it's tough to really complete it or, or let it draw out. And so there can't be judgment in that either because it's kind of what is to be expected for, for a lot of people. So it's just that gentle progression of easing down and grounding down and, you know, I think eventually making those physiological shifts helps make the mental shifts happen with the, with the thoughts and the, the overwhelm. So is that, is that what you were thinking a little bit, Brooke? Is, I, I could go yeah. I could talk about this for days. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that is. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and I also think just to add on to what you're saying, you know, when we, when we experience, I know for myself, when I experienced psychosis, there were a lot of things that I needed to talk about that I didn't feel like I had a place to talk about them. And so it stayed within me. And I think it like, kind of metaphorically made me sort of like, lose my, I, I, I blew my top. <laughs> there was like, there was no place else for it to go. Um, and because no one was like paying attention to what it was that I was trying to express, I thought, well, forget you guys, <laughs> and I'm just going to keep going within and like, you know, entertain myself because this, there's, I'm not, I'm not getting any, any, um, I'm not feeling resourced at, beyond myself. Um, there was just one other thing that I did want to address. So, so Violet suggested the four, 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 four breath last time. And what I did was the four, four, four breath where you can inhale whenever you're ready. Uh, yep. That's right. Inhale whenever you're ready. Inhale to four, hold for four, exhale for four, inhale when you're ready. The thing with that is that as you inhale, you're triggering the sympathetic nervous system or the stress response. So you're stressing out. Then when you're holding, you're still stressing out. That's, that's continuing. Then when you exhale, you'll notice that shift of subtle energy. There's a definite effect. The parasympathetic nervous system is what comes online during the exhalation and the pause at the end of the exhalation where vasodilation occurs oxygen levels can change blood moves takes the oxygen to the vital organs and allows for healing to occur that's a super simplified explanation of it 
So in my practice, what I teach is really focusing on the exhalation and the pause that resides at the end of the exhalation. And again, like we were talking about last time, the one-to-one -one ratio breath, inhaling to a count and exhaling to the same count, that's for depression. And then the one-to-two ratio breath, inhaling to a count and then exhaling to up to twice as long as that inhale, that's for anxiety relief. Um, we don't want to hold the breath and stress out too much. If it feels too stimulating, we want to back off, let go of that technique, and simply observe the breath. Observing the breath is a wonderful way to increase concentration, and that helps to support the parasympathetic nervous system too. So that's the relaxation response, the parasympathetic nervous system, the parachute that helps you come down slowly. Um, yeah. Like, I'll add to, I think about the, the exhale for me as this release that I'm really releasing something. And I think that you were talking about with the psychosis and all of the thoughts that you have in your, in your brain that you don't feel like if there's a safe space to get it out. And mm -hmm. I can feel that way with anxiety. Like my tank is overflowing. It's about to mm -hmm. overflow or, you know, like a balloon that just keeps filling with air and air and you just need some sort of release. And so focusing on the exhale as it can even be sort of a metaphor and a visual that you're releasing the anxiety. And I do think about that the energy and the tension that gets built up in our body, really you can direct that, you can use your thoughts to direct it down um, if that's where you feel like it needs to go as sort of a um, imagining that you're releasing as you do that, that you're releasing you know, really what's, what's going on inside. That's a, that's another thing that, that what you just said sparked because the exhale is so important. Yeah. And then in our tradition, when we exhale, we allow, we both inhale and exhale toward the spiritual eye. So we want energy to move up toward the prefrontal cortex. And I think it's Eckhart Tolle, maybe who's sort of made it mainstream that energy flows where attention goes. So um, that's, you know, just a modern way of putting how pranayama or the energy control of a yoga practice um, works. We, I also just introduced to you the double breath in this sec session, the sniff, sniff, ha ha breath. So that can be really great for both anxiety and depression because when you're inhaling that short, and then long, that short, that first short inhalation shows you how shallowly you may have been breathing. And then that next exhalation, it gives us a sense of self agency or empowerment because we recognize that we can override that stress response and breathe in more deeply and draw breath down to those lower lobes of the lungs where the brain drinks the oxygen from. Then the exhalation, that that's really toning the diaphragm. And as we start to be, begin to practice that regularly, the body starts to relax on that exhalation, that really long, slow second part, that second long ha breath. Then there's that pause where you're just maybe kind of spacey. We want to be spacey. That's like a, um, like a cheap thrill, I kind of call it. Um, in, in that, um, in that the, um, as we're exhaling and making the body relaxed and then inhaling again, we're stimulating the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is something that um, yoga research is looking at a lot when it comes to what the effects are of yoga and meditation on the nervous system. Um, so the, the vagus nerve is a wandering nerve. It's a big nerve and it's sending information from the body to the brain. If the body is stressed and uncomfortable, it's gonna tell the brain you're stressed and uncomfortable, stay in stress response, stay in fight, flight, or freeze. But if the body starts to become relaxed, the vagus nerve understands that and sends those messages to the brain. You're relaxed, everything's fine. Let digestion start again. Let saliv salivation happen again. Let all of those processes that, that stop during fight, flight, or freeze come back online so that we can function normally. Um, 
So the double breath is a really great thing in a pinch. If you're feeling like you need a, you know, a refresher, um, I love the double breath. And then the tensing with it and the relaxing on the exhale, that's called cyclic meditation. That also combines the, the mental and the physical um, with the breath. Um, and, and all those together are a super simple uh, mindfulness technique that can affect the physiology and the nervous system. Yeah, that's really interesting to learn about all of these breathing techniques. I've you know, been involved in yoga just for more of an exercise side, but it's really great to know what you know, those breathing techniques really do. I'm curious you know, if there's ones that are better for specifically in the moment when you're experiencing much more heightened levels of anxiety, and then what ones maybe you should practice like daily to kind of ease those times that anxiety rises, if that makes sense. I think that part for, for me when the anxiety is rising and what, what can you do in a pinch, I there's many different approaches. And one for me that I think is powerful is just to first notice the breath because oftentimes that we're not even thinking about it. Oftentimes we go through the whole day without even thinking about the fact that we're breathing. So sometimes even just being aware and then releasing the judgment of like, oh no, I'm, I might be breathing shallow. And then really I think the techniques that we're talking about here are great ones that can be used in a pinch. And I think some, you might feel the effects quicker than others. And for me, we talked about the, the four part breath. Um, we also call it 16 seconds is, is all it is. And it's less about counting the breath um, and more about observing the breath as it's going into the body. So what that is, is a present moment awareness technique. And what can happen when we're in a state of anxiety is we're really not in the present moment. And so any breathing technique, and, and that one I found to be very powerful, will get you right into that present moment awareness. And it's 16 seconds, so it's quick and easy. You can do it over and over again. I found that, and Brooke, I'm curious what your opinion is on for the extended exhale, exhaling for double the amount of time, um, that is extremely powerful and it's even more powerful when you do it for an extended amount of time. So if you can find a space, like if you're out in public, I think about like, just like you can go into the bathroom and, and, and close the stall and like take a few moments to, to really focus in on your breath and even the, the tense and release as well. Um, I think that the, the longer you can do it, you may feel the effects more potently, but it also, I think is always should be noted that subtle shifts are happening with the, with the breath when the awareness comes to the breath. So always giving the pat on the back for even stopping and, and just bringing your awareness there is powerful as well. But Brooke, I know that you are so well versed as well so well i would agree simple breath awareness in the short term and over the long term that's going to be your starting point always it is individual so like when i'm working with people uh, um, in yoga therapy i'm asking them a lot of questions about what their habits are and what their um, tendencies are um, how they respond and then offering these different techniques but depending on what I'm seeing, you know, in the space when I'm working with them um, and sending them off with really these kind of, there are like five sort of basic ones, simple breath awareness. Then I go to deep abdominal breathing. That one is great. You know, just breathing in deeply, letting your belly puff out and breathing out deeply, letting your belly sink back in. That's huge. It's, it's underrated. I think they're, the, we, we think that we need to do something super fancy and really sophisticated. These are really fancy and super sophisticated. They're really hard to do. They're simple, um, but they're challenging. So um, it would be simple breath awareness, the, the deep abdominal breathing, suggesting the one-to-one -one breath, the one-to-two breath, the double breath, 
those are kind of the five sort of basic ones that you can start with and sort of play with. I do suggest having a daily breathing practice. Um, and there are lots of different things that there are lots of different breathing techniques that you can do to manage. But again, that would kind of get more into the individual to, to introduce some more of those kind of um, just different ones but those five are appropriate I think for everybody yeah. to know that's that's great to know um, we had an, a comment on Facebook actually from Mark um, he said that breathing Hi, techniques Mark. and repeating white light and love timed with breaths works really well for him anywhere at any time yeah. um, that's I you know kind of brings up the question of introducing mantras into your practice. Mm -hmm. You know, breathing has such a physiological effect, you know, that really is mm -hmm. working with your body. Um, and mantras maybe touch more on kind of your psychological and mental, you know, play. Mm -hmm. What what is your opinion and thoughts on on mantras and having those incorporated in your practice? Mantras are very powerful. Uh, as well and there's a whole array of what a mantra can be I love like love and light so beautiful mm -hmm. and that can be a mantra oftentimes mantras are are something that you may repeat to yourself in your mind um, I know for me when I meditate I love mantra meditations and what it becomes um, when you are repeating a mantra is it becomes the object of your attention so wherever your attention is really can't focus on two things at once in true form. So if you have a mantra, that's a one pointed focusness that you can have on that, on that thing. And you, it's hard to think about other things. And so, you know, when a mantra is something so beautiful, like love and, and light, then that's a wonderful effect that also, a, you know, a subtle shift that will take place repeating that to yourself. But I, for me, it just immediately makes me think that's the object of your attention. And that's going to also bring you into the present moment. And that's powerful. Yeah. And then I would just add to that. And there's a lot to talk about with mantra. Um, the visualization piece is really potent too. Um, I think that mantra can be really helpful for those obsessive compulsive uh, energies to give ourselves something to redirect our mind to that may be helpful even in a therapeutic way that we don't quite understand yet if we're practicing mantra in Sanskrit or more appropriately pronounced Sanskrit they those those tones that we're creating with those Sanskrit words or sounds are said to be creating certain vibrations within the body centers or the chakras and that that is that in in and of itself is like tuning fine tuning an instrument um, our instrument the instrument of our body and our mind so um, finding a mantra that you like that feels comfortable that you can remember and that you want to repeat um, to yourself is great i introduced you all to what we usually call the Hong Sa technique. It's a preliminary meditation technique in the Kriya Yoga tradition. I did not offer the mantra while we were doing this at the beginning of the practice today because I don't want to alienate anybody who's not comfortable with Sanskrit at this point. But inhaling to a sound or a thought, I or love, and then exhaling to a sound or a thought, am or light, um, Inhaling, we, we mentally affirm the sound Hong, and exhaling, we mentally affirm the sound Sa in our tradition. Tibetan um, Buddhism, I think they do So Hum, um, Han Sa, there are lots of variations of that kind of seed mantra that's very common. Um, if you chant Om, that will be very relaxing. You don't wanna do that while you're driving, for example. Um, but you can find, you know, anything that, that feels right to you um, is a great way to trap the energy and redirect it someplace that might be more effective and um, even in life enhancing, you know. The, I just want to mention Thomas Ashley Ferrand 
is an author who has since passed away, but he has written a couple of great books that I keep on my shelf and suggest to my clients. Um, Healing Mantras is the name of one of the books. It has a lot of mantras in, in it um, and phonetically and they're simple and he describes them all and their good uses. And also Shakti Mantras, I think, and that's the different names of the goddesses and mantras that include those, those names and um, what their effects are as well. So I would suggest that Ashley Farrand, F-A-R-R-A-N-D. That's really, yeah, that's really great to know that it's so powerful. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I always feel a little bit nervous, like kind of speaking when I'm doing things, um, but I've always got like an expectation that it needs to be something like so important or have so much meaning, but when it's something as simple as, you know, light and love or I am, um, that's yeah, something that's very easy to incorporate, but really, really powerful. Um, so kind of moving on to a different question. Um, I love how you mentioned when we were doing our initial exercise this, um, earlier that progress, not perfection. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, related to anxiety as well as just daily life, we, I know I get anxiety from feeling like, you know, perfectionism and feeling like the need to do things perfectly. Um, how do you kind of overcome that feeling of perfection while you're practicing yoga? Mm -hmm. Or like, how do you remind yourself that you don't need to be perfect when you're doing this? Right. Well, this, this whole series is called something about self mastery, right? Which is sort of a joke because the only self mastery that we can do is to keep practicing and to be in the moment. Right. And, um, and, and not judging and doing the best that we can. Right. Um, this culture is based so much on perfection. We have to just kind of let that, just let that go and set it aside. Um, yeah, we're, we're all just trying to do the best that we can. And, you know, let's say I do a breathing practice or a mantra practice, you know, I'm, I'm developing discernment. I'm developing, I'm developing an awareness of what was that first breath like? And what's the second breath like? And what's this third breath like? And then I can combine everything that I've learned in those three breaths and I can do the fourth breath with that information. We're just learning as we go, you know, and um, and, and especially when we're trying to sort of control the nervous system, we need to find what our baseline is first. It's maybe causing us suffering, but it's perfect in that we know what we have to work with. And then we can do any other technique to get, to try to get to ourselves to really a more comfortable place. So these are practices for self mastery, um, to get to those states of enlightenment that are promised to us as a birthright in the yogic tradition. So, um, you know, we could, we could go more into that, but, you know, Violet, do you have anything that you want to say about that? Speaking as someone who highly identifies um, as, as someone that tries to be a perfectionist, this has been a, uh, you know, an interesting journey for me where ultimately I have accepted at this point that that is a natural tendency. I'm, I feel like I've almost been, I've allowed myself to be conditioned to think in that perfectionist point of view, which typically expresses itself as um, it's not good enough. I didn't do it good enough. And there's something that people will say with yoga, you know, to me as a yoga instructor, like, oh, I'm not good at yoga. I, I can't touch my toes. Um, I can't, you know, do a back bend. I don't know how to breathe, you know, all that stuff. Like there's no such thing as, as not being good at, at yoga. And that's part of what uh, that progression is. Progression's never ending. And I feel like sometimes perfection feels like there's a hard wall there. And if you don't meet it, then, you know, and what, you know, do I think I'm a failure? And that's typically all I can focus on is what I feel like I failed at, as opposed to like the progress that I've made along getting to the way. So having goals and some, you know, healthy expectations of where you'd like to go is so appropriate. 
And like Brooke said, the perfectionist aspect, it's like you almost have to let it go. Um, and when that voice in my head comes up of like, you didn't do it good enough or you weren't perfect enough, you know, I, I kind of find it endearing. <laughs> like it's just sort of uh, some little natural thing that has become at least what I allowed to, to become a part of me for a while. And it might take a little while for it to completely go away. But being able to kind of laugh at myself has been very helpful for me. Just be like, there you go, trying to be perfect. It's never going to happen. So you can, you can let it go. And you can, I have the self-love piece that really comes along, I think, with yoga is huge. You know, when you love yourself, it's forgive yourself. You know, you're not, no one's perfect. We're all progressing, you know, so. Yeah, it's the concept of acceptance, I think, maybe, you know. Yeah. Definitely. That's yeah, really wonderful to hear. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we're going to have to to kind of wrap things up now, but I would love, you know, if you guys have any suggestions of what our community should do during this next week before our, um, our next sec session next Wednesday. Homework? You want homework? Yeah, a little <laughs> like something for everyone to practice. Um, you know, just... So I was going to show, um, I was going to show another um, restorative posture, you know, any of those simple ones lying on your back with your neck supported and your legs supported or lying on your belly. Those restorative poses are great. Simple breath awareness. Ask yourself if you can do one breath in the morning and one breath in the evening that's conscious, conscientious. Um, another thing you could do is send us an email or comment on the Facebook or write to IBPF. And like, I really want to hear from people. And right at this time too, I want to hear from um, people of color right now. What's going on for you? And how is this affecting your mental health? Indigenous people, um, you know, like what, what is happening? The LGBTQ community, like this is Pride Month. There's a lot going on right now, and our mental health is being affected, everybody. So I'm curious what people want to, I'm curious what people, what people want. Do they want more chair movement? Do they want more breathing exercises? Do they want to know how to stand and do balancing poses to relieve anxiety? Because they, that's what that does. Like, you know, I'm, I, can communicate with us. That's what I would say is your homework and breathe and see if you can relax and cut yourself a lot of slack. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's some, some wonderful homework. So if, you know, so please email Brooke at brookewestyoga at gmail.com. Her information will be in our website advertisement and I can also put it in the comments on our Facebook live. Um, or you can email me and I can, you know, pass information along, info at ibpf.org, um, just any way that you can let us know. We would love to cater this to exactly what you guys want and need, because um, that's yeah. what we're here for. We're here to support you, um, so we want to continue mm -hmm. to do that. So thank you guys so much again for this wonderful um, session. I think, thank you all. Yeah, it was great to have the opportunity to chat a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, it's so great to hear your guys' insights and perspectives. Thank you. So this recording will be available on our website and our YouTube channel, or you can check immediately on our YouTube. Um, we want to remind you that this is a six-part offering, so we still have two more unique sessions to come, and we hope you all join us again um, next Wednesday. So thank you all for attending, and have a wonderful week, you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.